Hello, welcome to the Smarter Tech Podcast. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to talk with Dr. Marco Ruggiero once again, who was, uh, I must say, I would argue the favorite speaker on my EMF Hazard Summit in the last year. Uh, Dr. Ruggiero, thanks so much for being here on the show. Uh, thank you, Nick, so much for this great opportunity. It is a honor and a privilege being here with you. And I hope that today's talk will clarify any doubt uh, uh, might have arisen uh, from uh, my previous talk. Yes, and um, I think we can do a quick intro about uh, about you, your scientific background and credentials, and then quickly getting into Presidium, which is, uh, I would call it the product, but it's much more than that. I would call it the, uh, a pioneering invention in the realm of um, inner EMF protection in the form of a supplement. So please uh, go ahead and explain to maybe people that are not familiar with your work, what are your credentials and how you ended up creating something like this? Thank you so much. I'll try to be as short as possible sure. because uh, being a 66, you know, I have uh, a long <laughs> life and a relatively long academic career behind me. Anyway, I graduated from the medical school of the University of Florence, Italy, where I was born in 1980 at the age of 24. I served in the NATO Army as a Lieutenant Medical Officer. And uh, I mentioned this uh, because uh, in the Army, I was uh, first exposed to the issue of protection against radiation. So, so we're talking about the early 80s, and we were just in the midst of the hot phase of the so-called Cold War, and the threat of a nuclear blast were actually real as very tragically they are real in these uh, days. And so I was uh, trained in protection against uh, radioactive contamination, against uh, uh, the radioactivity coming uh, from nuclear blast. Uh, then I got a specialization in radiology. Uh, so again, X-rays, gamma rays, radiotherapy were my bread and butter for about five years of specialization. I have a PhD in molecular biology. I spent uh, uh, several years in the United States working as a postdoc first and then as a visiting scientist later, working at Barros Welcome, Big Pharma in North Carolina, for the US government at the NIH, National Institute of Health and National Cancer Institute to be more precise in Bethesda, Maryland. Then I was appointed a professor of molecular biology back in Italy, back in my hometown of Florence or Firenze. Uh, where I worked uh, doing research uh, for the following uh, 20 some years until uh, 2014 when I retired and I moved to United States, Arizona, where I'm sitting right now. Uh, over the course of my career, I published more than 240 scientific articles, uh, most of them in peer reviewed journals. And I worked uh, with some very uh, important and eminent scientists. Uh, it's a long list, so I will not. Uh, bore you with all of them. Uh, just to say that uh, one of the scientists who sponsored an article of mine was uh, the late Nobel laureate, Sir John Vane. Uh, my interest uh, is in the field of uh, protection against radiations and toxicants as well, uh, because of my background and also my familiar background. My father was a radiologist and he was one of the first radiologists in Italy after World War II. That is just at the beginning of the field of radiology when nobody knew much about radiations and nobody knew much about the dangers associated with radiations. And I remember as a child going sometimes in my father's office or in the vicinity of the X-ray machines. And I was fascinated by these things that you can't see, but they exert something on your body because you can see inside your bodies thanks to the X-rays. And also I was uh, somehow scared at the same time, fascinated by what my father told me about uh, the dangers inherent with radiations, something you don't see, something that doesn't sting, something that doesn't burn, but nevertheless is uh, deadlier sometimes than bullets. So <clears throat> this is a kind of my background. And about uh, three, four years ago, I, I embarked in this venture of devising a, a product, but as you said, more than a product is an entire approach to defend ourselves uh, from the inside, uh, from the radiations that are pervasive. Uh, we are surrounded by all types of radiations from a 
electromagnetic fields to unfortunately both man-made and natural radioactivity. You live in the northeastern part of the American continent, so you're quite familiar with radon. So that's uh, natural yes. radioactivity. Uh, but uh, we also have unfortunately man-made radioactivity from uh, nuclear power plants, uh, from uh, war zones, from uh, accidents, uh, from all types of things. Uh, and in addition to this, uh, you know, I'm uh, talking remotely. This means uh, that I'm surrounded by all the EMFs uh, that allow the um, wireless communication that allow me to, wall, to talk uh, with the uh, through my computer and so on. So because of all, all of these, I thought uh, that it would, have been, it would have been interesting to develop something that shielded us from the inside, from these pervasive uh, omnipresent radiations or electromagnetic fields. If you wish, I can tell you what's the difference between the two terms. Uh, if you're not, well, I think you are familiar with this. I don't know if all uh, the attendees will be familiar with the difference between EMFs and radiations, whatever. So mm, I try to stay as brief as possible. So this is me. <laughs> and uh, this is what I have done and what I'm planning to do for the near future, that is uh, to minimize the risk coming uh, from all these invisible radiations that surround us, invisible, but nonetheless, uh, uh, somehow harmful. Yeah, well, that's uh, thank you for being brief, and it was a great introduction to the topic. And yes, uh, I think we can dive right into the difference between, let's say, nuclear radiation, which I don't think there is a single human being on this planet that would deny is harmful to the human body, and then electromagnetic fields, namely the wireless or uh, electric fields, magnetic fields we're exposed to, and uh, the difference in how they impact the body. Um, and what, what, in your opinion, is uh, are they equally as dangerous? Does it depend on the dose? And what's your view on this? Thank you so much. Well, uh, if you give me the opportunity to share my screen, I have prepared just sure. a few slides uh, to elucidate this concept. So let's see if I'm able, apparently so. And uh, I guess you are looking at my first slide. Yes. Uh, you may think that this has little to do with uh, the topic of today's uh, talk, uh, but actually it has a lot to do. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, well, actually almost one month ago, uh, I attended uh, this prestigious conference uh, in Tucson that is called the Science of Consciousness. It's uh, the longest standing uh, conference in the world on this topic. It has gone on for 29 years, and the most eminent scientists in the field of neurosciences uh, attended this conference. This year, also Nobel laureate Sir Roger Penrose was there, and uh, uh, I also gave a talk, but I'm not about. I'm not going to talk about what I said at this conference because um, it's a different topic. What I wanted to show you, just to give you an idea of uh, how little do we know about ourselves and our relationship with electromagnetic fields. This is a talk that was given by a doctor, Dr. Phyllis Todd, from Washington State. And she talked about the sixth sense, uh, which is not only the title of an old movie with Bruce Willis of many years <laughs> ago, but actually we do have a sixth sense that is our ability inside our brains to perceive uh, magnetic fields, uh, more precisely the Hertz magnetic field. Now, I shall not go into the details, otherwise, uh, you know, it might take hours, but again, this slide comes from this presentation by Dr. Todd. Uh, so essentially at Caltech, uh, they did an experiment uh, that clearly demonstrated, uh, you know, inside the Faraday cage, so everything was uh, fully controlled, uh, no risk for any uh, artifact or for any bias. So this experiment, uh, that they, these results that they obtained at Caltech uh, tell us without any doubt uh, that we are able to perceive in our brains the Hertz magnetic field. And uh, birds, they use the earth magnetic fields to orient themselves so they know where to fly. Uh, it is not yet known whether this helps us in our orientation. Maybe we still need a compass, but we do have a natural compass in our heads. Now, why do I bring this uh, 
uh, to your attention because the earth magnetic field is only 0.5 Gauss. Gauss is a unit of measurement of magnetic fields like Tesla, actually Tesla is uh, 10,000 Gauss. So if we are able to feel in our heads 0.5 Gauss, think that our refrigerator has a magnetic field of 50 Gauss and an MRI, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, 5,000 Gauss. <laughs> so this is uh, to give you an idea of the, uh, let's say noise that we are immersed in, the, the magnetic, electromagnetic noise that surround us because our brains are able to perceive a 0.5 Gauss and we are surrounded by hundreds, of tens, of hundreds, of thousands of uh, Gausses of uh, Teslas of magnetic fields. Now going to, so this is just uh, to put in perspective, it is as if we were continuously exposed to an incredible bright light. Uh, you know, uh, we are able to perceive a uh, very uh, low level of light because we are not cats, but nevertheless, we still see in the dark. Uh, you know, the moonlight is more than enough for us to read or to, mm -hmm. to walk along the street without any lamp. And imagine that we are able to perceive this low amount of visible light and imagine that we are bombarded by incredibly uh, shining and bright light. So this is what happens with uh, our sixth sense that it is bombarded with uh, incredible amount of stimuli. Now, to talk about uh, radiation, so I found the etymology. Uh, so radiation comes from Latin, uh, like many other words, and it means rays or beams emitted, and it, it dates back to the 16th century. And essentially a radiation or an electromagnetic field is absolutely the same thing because this is due to this principle of physics that is almost 100 years old, that is a, the dual nature of radiation and matter. So you can think of radiations or electromagnetic fields as an ondulatory um, phenomenon, so like waves, or you can think of them as particles. And both interpretations are absolutely correct. So uh, radio waves or uh, visible light can be interpreted as waves, uh, electromagnetic waves, or as particles, photons. But in real life, uh, we tend to uh, make a distinction between EMFs and radiations. However, from the physical point of view, this comes from the National Cancer Institute that is very much interested in electromagnetic fields and cancer. There is an electromagnetic spectrum uh, that goes uh, from the frequencies uh, and of course, uh, uh, wavelength of uh, power lines or computers. Uh, and then you increase uh, the frequency and uh, decrease the wavelength. Uh, and you have the radio waves, uh, mobile phone, the microwave uh, to heat uh, your food, the infrared radiation, again, heat, then you have the spectrum of the visible light, and then you go up into uh, you go up into the energy of the particles of the photons, and you have what we call ionizing radiations, like the X rays that you use for uh, uh, mammography, for example, or use for chest X ray, and then the gamma rays that you use, for example, for radiotherapy. Now, all these from the radio waves to the gamma rays, you can call them electromagnetic fields or you can call them radiations. And you are correct absolutely both ways. Point is that the energy that is delivered by these EMS or radiations is different. And of course, I uh, very much prefer to be exposed to the radiations of my cell phone rather than to be exposed to the gamma rays coming from a nuclear blast. Yes. Because the energy that reaches my body, of course, is different. Uh, this is low, low energy. This is high energy. So even though so you can call them uh, uh, the same interchangeably, you can call them EMFs or radiations, in practical terms, there is a difference. Usually, we refer to radiations when we refer to ionizing radiations. Ionizing, it means that when they hit the molecules of our body, they produce ionization. That is, they change the charge in the molecules of our body. 
And this is particularly detrimental because it leads to mutations in the DNA, to mutations in the genes, ultimately to cancer if they don't kill you uh, right away. Because of course, doses this high, uh, you can die of uh, acute radiation exposure. So in practical terms, when we talk about radiations, we refer to ionizing radiations. That are radiations that deliver a very high amount of energy to our bodies. When we talk about electromagnetic fields, usually we refer to this uh, side of the spectrum, non-ionizing radiation. So electromagnetic fields are those of the radio waves, those that are in front of me because I'm in front of a computer, I'm surrounded by power lines, of course. Or if I go in my kitchen and I want to heat my sandwich, I use the microwave radiation inside the oven. Of course, I, I don't put myself inside the oven. <laughs> so usually we talk about EMFs. When we talk about a non-ionizing radiation, we talk about uh, radiations. We say radiations, so, you know, with a negative uh, accent. When yeah. we talk about ionizing radiations, X-rays, gamma rays, nuclear blast, uh, radiotherapy, chest X-ray. So those are the radiations so we refer to. Even so, as I said, if we want to be uh, etymologically and semantically correct, radiations and electromagnetic uh, fields are absolutely the same thing. But in a lay language, uh, let's say, I want to stay out, I want to stay away from radiations, and also to a certain extent, I also want to, to stay away from electromagnetic fields. Are they harmful the same way? Absolutely not. I mean, uh, that's logic. Uh, you, you don't want to have unnecessary X-rays, uh, but also you do not want to have unnecessary exposure to mobile phone radiations, to radio waves, uh, or to computer lights. Because uh, I, I know that this is difficult to understand and difficult to believe, but the type of damage that is exerted by radio waves or gamma rays on cells is absolutely the same. It is the same type of damage. What is different is the extent of the damage. Mm. So uh, essentially, uh, let's say that you uh, are punched in the face. Uh, the punch or the fist of those who punch you in the face you know, is the same act but it is much different whether it is a child or it is Mike Tyson and, uh, or Evander Holyfield. <laughs> no, I'm old, so uh, Mike Tyson or the late Muhammad Ali were my heroes of my youth. So when I talk uh, about boxers, I think about uh, these champions. So the act of punching you in the face is the same, but of course the difference is in the extent of the damage that the, the fist of a child can do and the fist of a boxer champion can do. So the type of damage inside the cells is absolutely the same, the extent is different. But since there is always a certain degree of damage, uh, you want, first of all, to limit exposure. Sometimes you can't, because you definitely can limit exposure to X-rays or gamma rays, stay away from a radiotherapy, stay away from X-rays, stay away from nuclear blasts, but it's uh, rather impossible to uh, limit exposure to the pervasive and omnipresent electromagnetic fields from radio waves to power lines, computers, and so on. That's why I invented the Presidium, to have something that works from the inside. Because I can shield myself from X-rays. That, that's actually what I did when I was working as a radiologist. I was always hiding behind a lead shield or more modern uh, you know, plexiglass shield. So at least you can see what's on the other side. So I was hiding myself. So I had a barrier. I had a physical shield uh, that the X-rays could not penetrate. Fine, but I cannot live inside a Faraday cage and if I lived inside the Faraday cage, of course, I could not communicate with anybody else in the world. I had no electricity in my home and so on. So it's practically impossible to be shielded from the pervasive EMFs. And because of this, I invented the Presidio that it is an inner shield. So the shield comes from the inside. So I can go everywhere I like. 
I try to limit exposure, of course, but I don't become paranoid if there are radio waves around me. I use them, otherwise we couldn't be talking. Uh, but at the same time, I feel protected because there is this shield that uh, is coming from inside. You know, I'm pointing toward my stomach because this shield is a supplement. So you swallow it. <laughs> it's not working from the stomach, but, you know, that's my way of, uh, let's say, you know, Italians, uh, they like to gesticulate and always to uh, move their <laughs> hands. <laughs> I, I try to limit this, but uh, probably it's written somewhere in my DNA. So... Uh, <laughs> I stop it here. Otherwise, uh, I will uh, you abuse your time. Go ahead. Um, well, this is this is great, and um, you know, Dr. Mercola, who is a colleague of mine, and uh, you really opened my eyes to scientific studies that uh, really corroborate what you said about <clears throat> nuclear radiation and the non-ionizing kind of radiation, uh, namely the wireless or even. Um, some of the visible light spectrum in, in the fact that the cellular mechanisms happen to be the same. If you look at uh, a study in particular that I'll put in the show notes, I don't recall the title, but it's, it was a review in 2017 where researchers looked at uh, the, the cellular effect of nuclear particles and nuclear poisoning. And they argued that most of the damage was not happening in the first microseconds where you have ionization, but after uh, after the downstream effects have happened in the, in the form of the creation of many uh, reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species, such as uh, peroxynitrite. And if you follow Dr. Martin Paul and other researchers in the, in the realm of EMF radiation, uh, the wireless and um, electricity, for example, magnetic fields, they argue that, well, it's all about peroxynitrite and oxidative stress. So in reality it is the amount of oxidative stress that is created. If you hang out around uh, a nuclear ex accident, uh, you probably wouldn't survive long, whereas most people seem to be able to survive, not necessarily thrive, but survive in an environment that is now highly polluted with wireless. So this is really what uh, he, he told me, and that's exactly on point, exactly um, the same as you've said. So I, I agree with that. And how can we... I guess how can we quantify? It's a, it's always a, a question that people have have asked me. Uh, what what we know right now in EMF science is there's no safe dose of EMFs because they haven't determined our safety standards are based on the wrong assumptions. So I guess that the principle that we've been telling everyone is the principle, the Alara principle, as low as reasonably achievable, which is one that is applied in nuclear radiation. Uh, do you agree with that? I guess the, the goal here is to minimize exposure as much as uh, is reasonably achievable for everyone. Yes, I absolutely agree. Uh, if I could digress a little, sure. I wanted to corroborate what you just said. Uh, I have uh, published uh, several articles um, on radio resistant cells. Why? Because working in radiation therapy of cancer, the, resistant of ca the resistance of cancer cells uh, to the ionizing radiations is a problem. You want to kill them all. And if they become resistant, uh, it's not good. Mm. Uh, so uh, being a molecular biologist, in addition to a radiologist, uh, we perform together with my research group in the, uni the university, we perform a number of experiments trying to elucidate how it was possible that some cancer cells, they became resistant. So you, you could throw as much radiation you wanted and they didn't die. But that's bad. That's too bad because I mean, it's a failure of the therapy. Uh, with the therapy, you want to kill the cancer cells. So we were on the other side of the barricade. We were pro-radiation because we <laughs> wanted the radiation gotcha. to yeah. kill the cells. Uh, so, essentially, I tell you something that uh, uh, most people, including uh, my PhD students, uh, couldn't believe with their eyes. You take a Petri dish uh, with human cells. You can do this with mouse cells. It uh, doesn't make any difference. So, you take a Petri dish with uh, cells uh, cultured in vitro in a Petri dish. So, there is nothing else. No immune system, no organism, nothing. Just the cells. And you put them just under... A radiotherapy equipment, and you uh, switch the equipment to the maximum, so to, to the what we call the supra lethal dose. 
So something that kills everything, okay? And you leave them much, much longer than a radiotherapy session. So essentially you do the worst possible. You give, you use all the radiations, in this case, gamma rays that were available. Then you look at the Petri dish under the microscope and the cells are perfectly fine. I mean, they do, you thought uh, now they're vaporized. So the PhD students thought, oh, now, now they're all vaporized. They were imagining, uh, you know, uh, fumes coming out from the Petri dish and the cells all dead, only fragments, only debris. No, they look perfectly normal as if nothing had happened. And they stay normal like this for a while until they decide to divide, to grow. And this is when all the damage that was exerted by the uh, reactive oxygen species uh, uh, that were caused by the radiations uh, and the nitrogen species, uh, now it is when the damage will appear. And they are yeah. unable to divide, they die by trying to divide, or they become more cancerous than they were before. And, and this is why we were doing these studies. But what uh, surprised everybody, I don't know if it surprises you, is that if you put cells, human or mouse or whatever cells, under the highest dose of radiation that you can think about, uh, short of a nuclear blast that of course, fortunately wasn't available for us, <laughs> uh, but cells uh, do not vaporize. I mean, they, they stay there, but the damage that has been exerted on the DNA by the reactive oxygen species shows up uh, later when the cells try to divide. If you do the same identical experiment using, instead of uh, an, uh, it's called a linear accelerator, the instrument to uh, erogate uh, radiations for therapy. Instead of a linear accelerator, you put the cells next to a cell phone. These experiments, uh, let me, I, I think I have the, the data. Yes, these experiments were done in 2002 uh, using this uh, cell phone, because this was a cell phone available in 2002. So you do the same identical experiment. You, you don't take uh, a linear accelerator. You take the same cells. In this case, uh, skin fibroblast. Why skin? Because of course the skin is the closest uh, cell uh, next to your cell phone. So you put the skin fibroblast in a petri dish next to the cell phone, you switch it on, uh, you have a, a real call, not, not a mock one. So somebody in the other room is calling this phone. Uh, nobody's answering, but the cells are exposed to the conversation. And by the way, somebody in the other room is also talking because uh, the waves are different whether you're talking or not. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Exactly the same of what happens if you put the cells under a linear accelerator for radiotherapy. At first, nothing. At first, they, the cells, they look perfectly fine, but then they change their shape, their genes are different, their rate of proliferation, that is the way they divide, is different. Of course, to a different extent, because as you said, the extent of the damage is different, but the mm. type of the damage is the same. So I just wanted to report this uh, uh, experience uh, that again, it might sound counterintuitive, but it is what is accepted by everybody. I mean, this uh, article was published 20 years ago, <laughs> and uh, today we can do the same with our two days cell phones and probably worse results. How can you quantify? Well, uh, if you look at cells, uh, if you look at uh, experimental settings, you can quantify this very easily by counting the number of cells that have the damage. And uh, there is a uh, a progression. So going uh, from here to here, the damage is greater, simple as this. So radio waves, they do the same type of damage as X-rays, but to a lesser extent. Point is the following. Uh, and this is something that uh, has been debated for years and years. If a small child punches you in the face, doesn't do much harm in comparison to a professional heavyweight champion who punches you in the face. But what if this child punches you in the face uh, 100 times a day, every day, in comparison to a heavyweight champion who punches you only once? 
Is the damage the same or different? Which one of the two is worse? Uh, there is not a clear cut answer to this question, but this is to give you an idea. Uh, usually you have an X-ray, let's say per year, let's say you're a woman, you have a mammography per year, by the way, mammography is uh, here, a low, uh, lower energy than a CAT scan or the airport security. So you have one mammography a year, so you're exposed to a certain uh, dose or to a certain extent of damage, but you have a cell phone every day of every, for a full year, every hour, every minute of the day, even worse if you keep it next to your next nightstand. Which one of the two is worse? There is not a clear cut answer. Uh, and the fact that, that there is not a clear cut answer tells you a lot. So Alara, of course, stay away as much as possible. Point is that unless you live in a cave, uh, far away from everything, even if you have only a little bit of electricity around you, you have the exposure to all the power lines. So Alara is fine, but you can never reach a zero exposure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, unless you go back in time, something that from the point of view of physics is possible, but you have to go back in time a long time ago before electricity. And at that point, uh, you know, uh, lifespan was much shorter than now. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you live in a uh, less polluted world, if it was, you live much less and you can say, okay, well, I wasn't exposed to EMS. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree a hundred percent. So um, it's it's especially true for electrosensitive individuals that uh, they are sometimes able to to go to very very low EMF environment, radio silent zone. But a lot of people who follow my work are in the middle. Maybe they feel slightly sensitive, but they live in cities and their friends are there, their family is there, and uh, most of them aren't willing to uh, to not live in a city. So the reality is also just the exposure if you get outside your home. Your home might be clean, you might even have uh, some, some of my colleagues are building biologists and they do shielded bedrooms. And that's good, but you sleep for eight hours. After that, you're outside the bedroom and you're exposed to the vicinity to the cell towers. So I see that the justification for a product that can help us increase, uh, let's say, our resilience to this uh, radiation and EMF, the entire spectrum. And and I think Presidium is very, very promising. Uh, how maybe, um, I know that in other conversations we've had, maybe not everyone is familiar with those. Uh, how does Presidium works? And how would you simply explain it? Because I know it's a product that has a lot of deep science behind it. Uh, but for the average lay person, what's the, the main idea behind Presidium and how it works? Well, uh, as I say, the uh, Presidium doesn't come out of the blue, comes out, uh, comes from 40 uh, some years of research, including mm -hmm. research in radiation resistance. Now you have two types of cells that are resistant to radiations. Unfortunately, cancer cells, or at least some types of cancer, some types of cancer cells. That's why radiotherapy is not always effective. But also you have bacteria. In particular, there is a strain of bacteria or a genus of bacteria called spirulina or artrospira, it's the same, uh, that is incredibly resistant to these radiations, to nuclear blasts. Uh, so we are not sharing any longer on the screen? Uh, sorry, I just, uh, I just thought oh, no, we, it's we fine, could just it's fine. stay like this in the meantime. Uh, no problem. So people so, can see our faces. Uh, good. <laughs> uh, so essentially, just to give you a reference, mm -hmm. humans are killed by three grays. Grays are a unit of measurements of ionizing radiations. And this was calculated by the tragic nuclear blasts in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. People who were inside the concrete structure, so they were not exposed to the thermic or mechanical effects of the blast, but only mm. to radiations, only. Three grays uh, are what kill humans. Spirulina withstand 6,000 grays. So you can imagine how resistant this microbe is to radiations. How does it do? It has no shield, it has no lead around it, simply it repairs with incredible efficacy the damage exerted by the radiations. 
the reactive oxygen species, the nitrogen species. So the spirulina, these species are generated inside the spirulina by the radiations, but the spirulina is so fast in repairing the damage exerted by these species and in eliminating these species, these reactive species, that in the end, it is extremely resistant to radiations. As I said, when I brought the example of the Petri dish, radiations do not vaporize the cells. Simply, they cause a damage that if it is not repaired, lead the cells to death. Mm. Cancer cells are able to overcome by, again, eliminating all the reactive oxygen species, all the nitrogen species, and by repairing uh, to their advantage the DNA damage to their advantage, so they become more cancerous. Spirulina does the same, doesn't become cancerous, because spirulina receives the punch, but is able to immediately uh, revert, restore the damage exerted by the radiations. So my reasoning was the following. Now that we know uh, what is the mechanism leading to radiation resistance, and we have learned this in the past with the cancer cells. We are learning this now with the spirulina. How can we uh, teach our human cells to become resistant to radiations? How can we learn from the spirulina? And here, all the years of working with microbiome medicine, uh, other products I've invented, including the probiotic called Bravo and so on, uh, came to fruition because uh, uh, Essentially, in Presidium, we have, let's say, three elements. On one side, we have the spirulina, that it is per se resistant to radiations. And it also helps with radiation sickness. It is used. It is used by NASA in the nutrition of astronauts. It is used when they had the Chernobyl accident in 1986. It was used in Fukushima. Wonder whether it is used in Ukraine now because, you know, big problems with the tanks rolling through the red forest and all these radioactive dust going everywhere. So spirulina is known to help with radiation poisoning, but only to a limited extent. In Presidium, essentially, we have a spirulina teach, if you want to use this term, its ability to repair the damage due to radiation, teach the microbial cells of uh, our probiotic blend. And the microbial cells of the, our probiotic blend, then they transfer this information to our human cells through a series of mechanisms, which include uh, uh, viruses uh, like phages, uh, healthy viruses that help uh, uh, with our health, and bio classical biochemical mechanism, gene transfer, horizontal gene transfer is called. And also, if you want uh, to go into the exotic, uh, quantum entanglement uh, between molecules of the three species, spirulina, probiotic blend, our uh, cells. Quantum entanglement, uh, fascinating field, uh, very difficult uh, to grasp, uh, for me almost impossible, so I try to repeat what I read, <laughs> because uh, uh, well, if Einstein wasn't unable to grasp uh, quantum entanglement and he called this spooky action at a distance, uh, I can imagine that I am able to grasp it or even worse to try to express. <laughs> the best I can do is uh, try to repeat what I've read. Mm -hmm. But uh, so different uh, types of mechanism. In short, since cells can be resistant to radiations, we had seen this with the cancer cells. We see this with the microbial cells. Uh, in Presidium, we exploit this ability of cells to be resistant and in Presidium, we have the spirulina teach the uh, probiotic cells and the probiotic cells transfer this, this information to our cell. So uh, I am not saying that I can go next uh, to the Chernobyl power plant that today is under siege. I don't, I don't know how is, the war is developing. It's developing very rapidly over there. So. I don't know whether I am protected up to the point that I could walk through the red forest unharmed. Well, I know for sure that I'm protected up to the point that I can sit next to my cell phone. I can undergo uh, routine x-rays if God forbids I have to undergo radiotherapy if, because God forbids uh, I develop a cancer, I feel safe, I feel protected. Uh, why? Because now my cells, because of Presidium are able to withstand a much 
a larger dose of radiations of all types, from radio waves to X-rays to gamma rays, than they were before. Why? Because they've been trained. They've been trained by the spirulina through the intermediate step of the probiotic. And so now my cells are more resistant than they were before I invented the procedure, before I began uh, taking the procedure. I don't know if these uh, rambling through concepts, uh, the war, Chernobyl and uh, microbes uh, makes any sense. It does. I hope so. It does. Thank you. Yes, this is actually, in all the conversations we've had, I think it was the, the best explanation in the sense that it was the most concise and helps me even understand it a little bit further. So it's the 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 natural resistance of spirulina that is being, uh, let's say, that is the, the main idea, but then it the transfer of that information to bacteria to a healthy probiotic and how that in return can then transfer that information to our cells in order to make our entire body more resistant to that radiation especially since we're talking about uh otherwise unavoidable exposures um how that's that's something i i've been meaning to ask you for a long time now that i think of it how would uh presidium differ from antioxidant-based approaches. I know that in scientific research, some people talk about selenium, vitamin E. I see different foods that are being used, such as uh, olive leaf extract. Uh, I see glutathione or SOD and other supplements being uh, put forward as potential radiation, let's say, inner shields. But how, how does your approach differ from taking antioxidants? Well, first of all, let me tell you, antioxidants, they do work, and there is no doubt about this. And I will answer your question with another question. And let's see if between the two of us, uh, we can reach uh, an agreement, uh, <laughs> uh, dealing, delving into very complex biochemical mechanisms. Uh, does the spirulina take any antioxidant? I don't think so. But even worse, do the cancer cells that become radiation resistant after one cycle of radiotherapy? That's the point. Uh, you have a cancer, well, I hope you, you never have one, but let's say somebody has a cancer and undergoes a first cycle of radiotherapy and the radiations of the radiotherapy, they're effective. They kill 90%, 99% if you like, of cancer cells success but 1% or 10% of the cells, they survive. Next time, all the cancer will be made by radiation resistant cancer cells. And next time, radiotherapy will not work. Radiotherapy will kill all the cancer, all the healthy cells around, doing a lot of damage. The cancer cells couldn't care less. Did somebody give any glutathione to the cancer cells? No. Did somebody give any selenium to the cancer cells? No, just like nobody gave any antioxidant to the spirulina. Point is that both the cancer cells or the spirulina, they do produce their own antioxidant inside. That's, why, that's how they work. So uh, as a defense mechanism, again, think about the cancer cells as an organism. Tries, they try to defend themselves from this aggression from the outside. And the spirulina does the same. So as a defense mechanism, they develop their antioxidant uh, molecules inside. And they develop the ability to repair the damage exerted by the oxidative species. So that's the main difference. And conceptually is the same difference between a lead shield and the presidium. The antioxidant that you take helps you absolutely from the outside. So it has to be seen how much of that antioxidant is uptaken, how much crosses uh, the intestine, how much in the end goes in each cell of your body. And that little does something, but it is, it is little that comes from the outside. With presidium is the other way around. We teach our cells to produce inside them the antioxidant molecules. We teach our cells to repair the damage exerted by the reactive oxygen species. Gotcha. So in a way, teaching cells to 
figure out their own way of being resistant to radiation will very likely be much more sophisticated than anyone trying to figure out how much glutathione or vitamin C do I need. Uh, cells have this inherent intelligence inside, so if you teach them to adopt a certain behavior like being resistant to radiation, they will figure out the right dosage internally and not... You, you cannot really have that level of sophistication with a bunch of bottles, right? So that's how I exactly. think about it. No, that, that's uh, perfectly right. I mean, uh, uh, I'm happy that uh, I've been able somehow to convey such a complex uh, concept, but uh, what you said is absolutely right. There is also another point uh, that, uh, another advantage. Uh, you don't know when you are exposed to uh, EMFs, so uh, le let's keep the radiation society, the ionizing ra radiation society for a moment. Okay. So let's hope that nobody uh, throws a, a nuclear bomb uh, right now. Uh, <laughs> and let's hope that uh, all, all, all the mess in Ukraine uh, doesn't come uh, to the shores on the other side of the Atlantic. Even so, it, it's not yeah. true because uh, at the time of the Chernobyl accident, uh, high level of radioactivity were recorded in New York State. At the time of Fukushima, uh, now the uh, right now the California red wine is radioactive, and it is the radioactive from Fukushima. They say it's harmless, maybe so, but you know, I, unfortunately, yeah. I don't drink wine, so <laughs> I'm not personally interested. But so let's talk about EMFs. Let's talk about radio waves, uh, power lines, uh, cell phones. I have absolutely no idea about uh, let's, what we call the dosimetry. So how much exposure am I in, the, in this very moment? I don't know, I have no idea. I, I could measure, but you know, it's incredibly complicated. And then uh, my life uh, would become obsessed by this. So essentially uh, I know that there are electromagnetic fields all around me right now. I don't know the dose, I don't know much. If I had to rely upon exclusively something that I take, some antioxidant I take, I had no idea whether right now I need much or I need less because uh, there is much or there is less. I have no idea. And so it could be very inaccurate. I might take unnecessary amount of antioxidant. I might yeah. take too little. But if I let my cell decide, you know, the cell, they do not produce anything unless they feel a danger. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if they feel a danger because uh, right now there is a too much exposure, there are too many EMFs around me, they do produce as many antioxidants they need, not more, not less. And I, I, I don't care. I mean, I, I should not be worried of what my cells do. It's a much deeper level of consciousness. I mean, and this is something we learn in Tucson at that conference. Cells, they do have their own consciousness that of course it doesn't come up to our uh, conscious uh, thinking so we ignore what is happening in each of our uh, millions of cells inside our body, but they know what they are doing. In particular, if you teach them to do something, if you train them to do something that they were not trained to do. And so I let them deal uh, with the exposure. I don't care whether right now there is more or less. They do produce enough antioxidant. They do repair my DNA to the extent that it needs to be repaired because their goal is the same as my goal to survive. And if they perceive uh, something that puts their survival in danger, they fix it. That's as simple as this. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, the uh, molecular hydrogen research where it's a selective antioxidant. If you, if you have too much, too much oxidation going on, it will have an antioxidant effect. If you have too little, it, it, it will not um, kind of have the, the, the opposite effect. So anyway, it just reminds me of that certain mechanisms in, in, in nature are way more sophisticated than just uh, more is better, kind of the American approach, you know, like bigger format is better, kind of fast food way of thinking. Uh, so yeah, that's a very, very sophisticated. I like it. And um, I had a question here um, that your team sent. I think it's, it's tremendous. Uh, can Presidium help us with long-term radiation damage? Uh, that, that's very relevant because nowadays, let's say my kid, uh, he's now four-year-old, and 
the moment it was born, it was exposed to these rays, uh, the electro smog in the environment. Can that is that damage permanent, or can Presidium help reverse some of the damage that already occurred? Uh, well, both uh, both answers are correct. Let me. Again, uh, these, these are difficult questions. Um, <laughs> I know the answers, but I have to rephrase them. And by the way, I have an additional uh, difficulty because uh, in my brain, I still think in my mother tongue that is Italian, and I have to simultaneously translate and trying to make sense, which is difficult in both languages. Uh, first of all, let me tell you this. The damage exerted by radiations, all types of radiations, is cumulative. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to my experience as a child of a radiologist, uh, I was very happy when I was a child that, uh, unlike all my other schoolmates, uh, we had 45 days of vacation with my father instead of the usual 30 days that were normal in the Italy of the 60s and the 70s, where everybody had 30 days of vacation, usually from the 1st to the 31st of August. Italy was completely shut down. In August, everybody was at the beach. And we had 45 days, so we were lucky. Why? Uh, because since my father was professionally exposed to radiations, being a radiologist, there was this idea that if you give more time uh, for the body to recuperate, uh, you know, the worker, because of course the radiology is a worker, so this was for worker protection, the worker will have more time to fix whatever damage exerted by ra the radiations. And while uh, we were happy, of course, to enjoy these uh, uh, further two weeks of vacation, my father always told me, uh, this is all BS. <laughs> <laughs> in Italian, even worse, I, I want to try to translate uh, because it's ab absolutely wrong. So let's enjoy the vacation, but do not think that two weeks more per year will make any difference because the damage will accumulate. Mm -hmm. So the point is to avoid the damage. And with the Presidium, you avoid the, the damage because you fix the damage be before it occurs. So essentially, uh, it works also against past exposure to radiation. Why? Because unless you have exposed to acute radiation poisoning and you, you wouldn't be here talking, the uh, damage has not uh, manifested its effect. So you're still on time because the uh, presidium will work by fixing further damage. And since uh, nobody knows where is the threshold, the sooner you stop the effects, even of the past irradiation, the better it is. And the uh, more likely is that you will never suffer any consequence. Now, uh, it's almost one hour, but have I five more minutes? Yes, maybe 10, because what we're about good. when I, what I am about to show you uh, defies logic. Uh, the results have been described beyond strange by the scientists who have published this article in the in PubMed. So we're talking about uh, because thanks to quantum entanglement, the effects can go back in the past and fix something in the past. Of course, I mean I see. Uh, from your expression that uh, well, nobody could believe this unless you do the experiments. So g give me again, please, uh, the uh, share screen. You should be able to share again. again. Yes, I think you, you can. Yes. Okay, so you see this. Now, this was done with fish. Oh, this is, have you ever seen this? You, you can live very well without the brain uh, another time. <laughs> Yeah, I, I did share that in a recent newsletter. <laughs> so please look look for my newsletter about people living without a brain. I was <laughs> I was speechless when you shared that. Oh uh, well, God. and if you look at the presentations given in Tucson, the science of consciousness, it is explained very well where does consciousness reside, not necessarily in the brain, somewhere else. My God, hey, do, sorry to interrupt. Do we have access to this conference somehow? Can we pay for uh, the replays? You have a full access for free to the previous year. 
Okay. I don't know. I don't know yet this year because they still have to put it online. Uh, I'm not saying the scientists always repeat the same things, uh, <laughs> but more or less we do. So from gotcha. the previous year conference, uh, you can grasp 90% of what has been said Tremendous. this year. Perfect. Now, uh, okay, these experiments were published in 2018 by Canadian researchers, and they uh, did, this, did these experiments on two types of fish, rainbow trout, probably good to eat, and uh, zebra fish, very, very small fish. Why these two fish? Uh, because they are separated by millions of years of evolution. Hmm. So they're both fish, but very different. So this means that essentially what they saw could be applied to all type of fish. And now we know it could be applied to all type of organism from mouse to elephants to humans. First type, of, first part of the experiment, easy to understand. Uh, group of fish in tank A, group of fish in tank B with all the water, all they need for their survival, for their happiness. Uh, those in tank A, they are irradiated by a quasi little dose of X-rays. So not enough to kill the fish, but enough to exert uh, serious damage. Okay. Then these uh, two group, uh, and these of course in tank B, they are left alone. Uh, then the two group of fish, they swim together for two hours in a tank, but they're separated by a mesh screen. So they can't touch each other. Nevertheless, you cannot rule out they, they could exchange some information, some molecules that are secreted, some hormones or something. They could, uh, never been found, didn't find any molecule, didn't find any hormone, didn't find anything. So, but you cannot rule out maybe an incredibly low amount, maybe homeopathy type things, who knows? Yeah. Nevertheless, you cannot rule out that they communicate something, or maybe they do not exchange any molecule, but they have a way of moving, they have a way of swimming, they have a way of behaving that essentially tells something uh, from the fish who have been irradiated to the fish that have not been irradiated. Then after two hours, they're separated. They go back in another tank, in another room, and they go in another room. Now, the scientist, here they look for some proteins that are expressed, that are produced after irradiation, that are known to be produced after irradiation as a defense mechanism. And of course, they find that these fish, they produce these proteins as part of their defense mechanism. To their limited surprise, they see that also these fish that had not been irradiated, they produce the same defense proteins to the same extent. How can you interpret this experiment? Now, the fish in group A, uh, when they, they have the opportunity to swim together with the fish in group B that had not been irradiated, they tell the fish of group B, oh, look what has happened to us. We have been irradiated, bad, bad, bad. We're now producing our defense protein. We suggest that you also produce yours because you never yeah. know what could happen. So even if so, you have not been irradiated, we give you this advice, produce these defense proteins. Mm -hmm. Understandable, difficult to understand how they communicate this, but still uh, does not defy our logic. Next goes beyond incredible. Fish in tank A, fish in tank B, nobody does anything to any of them. They're both left in peace, swim together, what do they communicate to each other since nothing has happened? How is the weather in your tank? Uh, how are the humans uh, in your tank? Are they kind enough? Do they give you enough food? Be because there is nothing else, if not a small chat, to communicate because nothing has happened. Separated again, group A irradiated again. And of course, I mean, they receive this dose of radiation. They do produce the proteins that try to defend themselves. Group B they also do the same. How is this possible? Uh, if that's, not, that's where you say entanglement. It looks like they're linked now. They are in entangled some in yeah. some way. Or uh, if you don't want to go wilder, they call the, this is called retrocausation. And again, I'm not talking about uh, mediumship, which by the way is something that has been demonstrated, but I'm not talking about the channeling uh, 
uh, the pharaohs. I'm talking about something that is explored by neuroscientists uh, as those who came to this conference. Retrocausation means essentially, oh, listen, we are altruistic. Let's go back in time when we were swimming together. Let's tell the, this poor fish in tank B that this could happen so they could uh, establish their defenses. Retrocausation, going back in time, uh, the effect uh, come before the cause. Uh, I mean, if you, if you can't believe this, uh, you are in good company because <laughs> nobody can understand this, uh, <laughs> but you have to, uh, if you want to be a scientist, you have to accept the results, even though when they do not make any sense to your senses because your senses are limited. Because these are the results. And I mean, they are so strong that they've been published in a radiology journal, those response, uh, they have been accepted by the National Library of Medicine of the US, so that is very selective. Uh, so you don't understand them, your problem, because the results are here. And the results are, I agree, beyond strange. Retrocausation is difficult to conceive that something uh, can go back in time. Uh, well, it's difficult to conceive for us. For physicists, it's absolutely normal. For physicists, they know that time can go this way or can go that way. It happens all the times with particles. We are made of particles, fish are made of particles. So it, it, why we shouldn't or they shouldn't go back in time? Point is that we have limitations in our brain, so we cannot conceive this. We do not realize this. We do not understand this. Our limitations of our brain, assuming this brain does something, and presidium, since it works at this level, at the quantum entanglement level, can fix something that has occurred in the past. Uh, I realize, I mean, I, I can't believe my own words. So how do I dare to think that anybody else can believe them, but the results are here. And with presidium, uh, we studied that this article in great detail. And when I formulated Presidium, I kept this very much in mind because I was not happy with simply shielding myself from future exposure. I wanted to fix all the unhealthy exposure I've had in the past when I, I didn't realize very well what I was doing and so on. So that's uh, how we studied this in detail. We incorporated this information. We don't use fish, we use bacteria but the principle is absolutely the same mm, yeah that's <laughs> my god i don't know how to comment i think i'm gonna add time time travel uh alert in <laughs> in the title of this episode warning this is this is better than back to the future my god this is this has been a fascinating interview i have so many questions left i i know we're, we're gonna have to chat again and uh, i'm not sad about it because each time we talk it's a new fascinating conversation and so many great points you bring to the table uh it, it's really an honor to to share this time with you uh something we have arranged and something i'm excited about for people who want to try presidium I'm gonna mention that uh, for some people, the the three month supply was a bit was a bit cost prohibitive if uh, they just wanted to try it. So something that Presidium put together at uh, presidium dot life slash emf guy thirty is forty percent of the 30 caps supply. So it's one month, and you can try it for yourself. And I can report that. In my uh, in the group that I share with Brian Hoyer, my colleague in uh, our course Electropollution Fix, people who want to minimize EMFs in their homes, the, a few people told us that they tried Presidium, and one lady in particular had a, a very surprising results, positive results on her sleep. Uh, namely, she could get barely any deep sleep before, and after a few days of Presidium, she saw incredible amount of, the, of deep sleep. So I have a few anecdotes already in my community where people saw uh, tremendous differences. And I mean, it's not uh, a claim that everyone will have that, but regardless of what you feel about it, I think there can be there could be benefits in this day and age to take a product like this. Uh, maybe as a parting words, Dr. Ruggiero, um, I see that uh, in the list of questions you sent, it was about sleep. I'm very curious, what are the mechanisms that could explain why someone would sleep better when taking something against uh, radiation damage? Well, uh, this goes back uh, to one of the first slides that I showed, that is, uh, in our brains, uh, we have the ability to uh, feel electromagnetic fields, and this is innate. 
Now, in our brains, we also have a brain waves, a theta, gamma, a number of brain waves that are associated with a state of being awake or sleep, different phases of sleep, REM sleep or deep sleep, light sleep, and so on. In other words, uh, our brain works through electromagnetic fields up to the point that there is a branch that is called a magnetoelectroencephalography. So essentially you record uh, not the electric wave, but the electromagnetic waves around our head. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of information, I mean, when you meditate, your brain waves change. When you take uh, psilocybin, your brain uh, waves change. When you are anxious, your brain waves change. So just to say that brain waves are uh, the, um, one of the manifestations of the working of our brains. And sleep is characterized by certain types of brain waves uh, that are uh, heavily disrupted by external EMFs. Like again, uh, the cell phone that you leave on your nightstand, you shouldn't do this. <laughs> or yeah. uh, reading on your computer before going to bed, you shouldn't do this, uh, find, find a book, a real paper book. Uh, because all these will uh, change the pattern of our brain waves. And this pattern of brain waves changes because, again, of the cellular damage exerted by these radiations. So if you prevent these with presidium, you prevent the disruption of the brain waves mm. that is exerted by the external EMFs. No wonder that at that point, your physiological pattern of brain waves goes back to normal and you sleep the way you are supposed to sleep. Uh, we have uh, uh, data that, uh, if you wish I can show them, uh, have been published in a peer review article uh, demonstrating how Presidium helps uh, with a particular type of uh, electrical phenomenon that is called uh, heart rate variability. You know, our heart, uh, the interval between each heartbeat is different, it is not always the same. Uh, looks to be the same, but if you go to the milliseconds, it's different. So the greater the variability, uh, the healthier you are. Low heart rate variability, higher risk of death for all causes and poor health. High rate variability, good health, to make it very, very simple. Now, uh, if you are exposed to external EMFs, your heart rate variability goes down because of the sympathetic, parasympathetic balance that again, electrical phenomena that are negatively influenced by external bombardment of unnatural, man-made, polarized EMFs. This is something else. Uh, natural EMFs are not polarized. Man-made EMFs are polarized. They're much more bioeffective, which is not good. They have mm -hmm. a greater effect. Now, all the electrical phenomena of our body, from the heartbeat to the brain waves, they are affected by these man made EMFs. Because Presidium uh, helps minimizing these damaging effects, then it reverts to normal physiology all these electrical phenomena. So the heart rate variability goes up by taking the Presidium. The REM sleep goes up, the brain waves go to normal, not necessarily up. They, they go back to the normal pattern. So this can be easily explained considering that sleep, like focus, you know, another effect that many people report, in particular those with the electrosensitivity, is that after taking Presidium, their focus, their memory, their ability to learn is better. Why? Not because Presidium has any neuro, uh, neurological effect per se, but because it normalizes the uh, frequencies of discharge of the neurons, so the brain waves, the electricity inside our brains that are negatively affected by the external EMFs. Mm. Uh, and sleep is one of the first uh, uh, symptoms or the first uh, phenomena that is uh, positively affected by presidium, in particular in those who suffer of electrosensitivity. That's tremendous. And I, I think it makes the, what you said, going back to normal and not necessarily going above baseline, but that's not the goal here. If you make your cells resistant to radiation, what does that mean? Well, uh, they're better able to cope with the environment. So if the environment is putting you in a, in a, with a certain symptomology towards bad sleep, 
well, maybe it can make you back go back to normal. And it makes a lot of sense that the brain is affected and that, well, many things can happen with presidium or if your res radiation resistance goes up. So it makes a lot of sense that for different people, different effects could be seen, especially in the most sensitive ones that are very attuned to their level of sensitivity. I think these individuals are much more likely to feel it first, really feel the difference. Whereas other people that are very healthy already, maybe have great sleep, great brain function, it's going to work in the background still and still have an effect, but maybe it's going to be a more subtle one. I know that for me, my uh, electrical sensitivity has changed throughout the years. When I wrote my book five or six years ago, if I was connected via Wi-Fi in front of a computer, after an hour or two, I got massive brain fog. Nowadays, I could hang out in coffee shops and not have this effect happen, but I know that my state of health in general has improved. Uh, so my sensitivity has gone down as a result. So maybe my innate radiation resistance is better in that sense. My cells are better able to cope with the oxidative stress of the environment and my sleep has normalized and my hormones have norm normalized. So it can vary in time, but that's very fascinating that uh, this is reported and more and more people are telling me that it has positively in impacted their sleep, but it's not just about sleep. It's much more than that. And we can get into that in future conversations. Dr. Ruggiero, thank you so much for being thank here. You. It was amazing. Again, a reminder, presidium.life. It's going to be under uh, the podcast or video version of this slash EMF guy 30. And that's for your 40% off the 30 cap supply. It becomes much more affordable if you want to try it, which I do recommend indeed. Uh, and this will be for a limited time. So just uh, see in the show notes, it's going to be up for a few weeks only since this is such a deep discount. Uh, Dr. Ruggiero, is there any other website or resource you want to mention so that people can follow your work? Uh, no, uh, well, on the Presidium Life uh, website, uh, mm -hmm. we put all the uh, most recent observation. Uh, so I think that as far as Presidium is concerned, uh, the www.presidium.life website is the best source for information. But of course, I'm open. And so if uh, any one of your attendees uh, or your web contacts uh, wants to ask something, uh, you have my contacts. Uh, and if please feel free to ask and I should be more than happy to try to answer. Thank you so much. You're so generous with your time. I don't know how you did it. Uh, you do it with all the conferences and all your <laughs> scientific studies, but uh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so, so, so grateful for all the work you put into this and also how generous you are with your time. So thank you so much. From the I don't of think heart. I'm generous because uh, I am enjoying <laughs> this. So I, I, I'm not uh, so much altruistic, I'm egoistic. The point is that I feel so enthusiastic about this that I could speak for hours. Uh, and uh, we all know that you don't pay me by the hour to speak. Uh, on the contrary, I wish I could pay you because of this opportunity you give me to speak about these things that uh, uh, truly give a meaning to my life and give a meaning to my research. And uh, I was so happy today that we have had uh, these... Uh, freewheeling interview because uh, you know I like to talk about my past experience when uh, I was a child uh, walking next to my father in the radiology room and I was working with the cancer cells and we wanted the, the radiations to kill them all then we were <laughs> successful and now that experience comes back uh, to our use and so on so uh, I'm grateful I'm truly grateful and uh, I thank you for your time and for this great opportunity. Thank you. It means a lot. And uh, I hope we're going to do this again a little bit later, later this year. Sure. Thank you. And bye-bye then. Thank you so much.